Thank you so much for inviting me to present on the physical science basis of carbon dioxide removal. So as mentioned, my expertise is in climate science and I focus on carbon sequestration and verification standards. So according to the scientific community, the earth is now warmer than in the past 125,000 years. And it is virtually certain that human activities are causing this change. Most of the world is experiencing the impacts of climate change from extreme heat to larger wildfires to more intense droughts and floods. Some of these changes have been happening for decades in the developing world, but are only starting to hurt now in the developed world in recent years. To try to limit further damage, the world agreed to limit warming to well below two degrees Celsius with stark warning from the scientific community of impacts even at 1.5 degrees Celsius. The reality though, is that we will cross the 1.5 degrees Celsius sometime soon, maybe in the next two decades, two degrees Celsius very likely after that. And we are heading for well over two degrees Celsius if efforts currently and climate policies are not ramped up. Why is this happening? We can start by imagining the atmosphere is like a bathtub with a partially opened drain. The tap represents man-made emissions of greenhouse gases. And here we can focus on CO2, which is the main greenhouse gas and is produced by burning fossil fuels. The drain represents the natural removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere by the biosphere, the oceans, and by geological processes. And each are working to remove CO2 at different speeds. So plants and the ocean work on timescales of decades to millennia, while geological processes work on timescales of tens to hundreds of thousands of years. And because the drain is so slow compared to the flow from the tap, leaving the tap running will increase the water level in the tub. So over the past 150 years, we have continued to open the tap, emitting greenhouse gases at rates much faster than can be drained naturally. The result is an increasing level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and in turn, this is causing rising temperatures. The good news is that over the past decade, it seems that we have stopped opening the tap. The bad news is that the tap is still flowing as we are still producing emissions and the drain is still too slow. So the level of CO2 continues to rise. For the level to stop rising, we have two choices. Either emissions go to zero, or the inflow must equal the outflow, and this is known as net zero. The added challenge is that we have delayed climate action for so long that even if we reach net zero or zero emissions sometime soon, the level of CO2 will be too high. The associated rise in temperature will cause damages to ecosystems that we depend on to support us, like coral reefs and the Arctic sea ice, and increase risks such as flooding. We will need to adapt, but we also will need to reduce the level of CO2 in the atmosphere to bring it back to a safer level. In a net zero concept, this would mean making the outflow from the drain larger than the inflow from the tap. In other words, we will need to reach negative emissions where human-made removals are larger than human-made emissions. So the question now becomes, how do we get to net zero emissions and reduce the level of CO2. For decades, the message has been that we need to reduce emissions, and this is still the priority. The added message of today is that reducing emissions is not enough. We will need to also remove. How much we will need to remove will depend on how successful we are at reducing emissions. From a technical, techni technological point of view, uh, 70 to 80% of emissions are considered quote unquote easily reduced compared to the last 20% which are called hard to abate from sectors such as aviation, shipping and from the production of structural materials. However, as Flagstaff and Boulder County and many others are finding out, even the easy reductions are difficult socially and politically as it requires transforming our entire way of life. So to handle the consequences of these difficulties and to reach net zero or, or zero emission goal to limit further damages of climate change, I will now introduce some of the tools on hand when it comes to removing 
emissions. In discussions of climate action, you will hear many acronyms, and it's very easy to get discouraged and think they are all the same. Um, but the differences really do matter. So to be clear about what we are talking about today, I would like to go through three different acronyms that you will hear in discussions. The first is CCS, or Carbon Capture and Storage. This generally refers to technology that is used to prevent CO2 from escaping a power plant. The CO2 is then compressed and injected into geological formations. CCS enables existing infrastructure to continue and has been around for decades, but by itself does not remove emissions. Then there is CCU, or carbon capture and utilization, which usually refers to capturing CO2 from the air and using the CO2 to make valuable but short lasting products, such as beverages and fuels. With CCU, the CO2 ultimately returns to the air. And this practice will have an important role to play to move society to a circular carbon economy because it uses non-fossil CO2 instead of fossil CO2. There are many forms of CCU that overlaps with CDR, um, such as concrete, for example. And CDR stands for carbon dioxide removal. This is a practice which refers to capturing CO2 from the environment and storing it somewhere in a reservoir to prevent it from returning to the atmosphere. When it is done right, CDR can deliver emission removals, whereas CCU and CCS do not. In most instances, the CO2 will be stored in a reservoir that has no direct use. So for example, a geological formation. Whereas in other instances, CO2 can be stored in useful but long lasting products such as construction materials like concrete and non-fossil plastics. CDR is always a two-step practice. First, carbon is captured by technology or by a natural process or by some kind of practice then it is stored in a carbon reservoir. And many different combinations exist on a spectrum from nature-based to engineered with some hybrids in between. So for one example of a, a more nature-based CDR is the planting and nursing of trees so that as the trees grow, they capture and store carbon. Another example that is more engineering-based uh, is capturing carbon from the air using direct air capture, compressing the CO2 as a gas and injecting into geological formations or rocks like basalt to form carbonates. All these types of CDR are just not made equal. And when designing or supporting CDR projects, it is important to think along several dimensions and to think about how these dimensions overlap. The main dimensions are, are listed on the slide here. So we need to think about the reservoir durability and reversal risks. So how long can carbon be stored and how vulnerable it is to being released? We can think about reservoir durability, reservoir reversal risks. So that's how long carbon can be stored and how vulnerable it is to being released. And this is a, a dimension that matters because when we consider the long-term requirements of using CDR for climate action. Then we need to think about the costs and the required investments to remove a, of a ton of carbon, as well as the long term maintenance and monitoring. We also need to consider the maturity of the CDR type in terms of deployment, in terms of our knowledge of the consequences, and in terms of the protocols to measure and verify the carbon has been stored. Um, and then we also need to think about the benefits and side effects. Uh, asking for whom, for what, and on what scale. And finally, when looking at projects, we need to think about the social and environmental justice uh, considerations and ask if the decisions follow a democratic process. And later, you will hear from Jane from Carbon Direct about how they are developing guidelines and best practices to navigate all of these dimensions. And finally, to wrap up, the challenge is to navigate all of the dimensions I just mentioned so that removals can be ramped up at scale quickly, but responsibly and with quality. Pathways that limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius are the ones in, in blue in the, in the figure. And when they limit the overshoot, uh, they imply that we will need to reach 
10 gigatons of removal per year by the year 2050 and 10 to 20 gigatons removal per year by 2100. And for context, we emit every year about 40 gigatons and we have emitted over 2,400 gigatons of carbon over the past 150 years. So this get decade is really crucial. It is the decade for testing, for deploying, not only to bring the cost down, but to really find out if CDR will, will work and help us achieve our goals. But for now, I, would, I, I will turn to Ramon and to Susie, who will describe how Flagstaff and Boulder County are beginning their journey. Thank you. <laughs> 